Okay, welcome. I haven't seen Derek since Moscow. Really? Is this the first time you meet since the making? Yes, yes. And it was because we, we spoke before. That was two years ago, right? Yeah, it was uh, 2018. Yes, mm. winter 2018. Yeah, yeah. And Derek, was this what you expected? No, no. I, I, <laughs> Why not? To be honest, I, I, someone asked me, there's an American guy who wants to do an interview with you. I thought it was just an interview, but then they arrived with all these cameras, and, and the guy went on for like three hours. So <laughs> then it dawned on me, it must be something bigger. <laughs> and so did you already know, did, did you have a very precise idea what this would be about? Because when I was watching this uh, film, I think it was two weeks ago for the first time, I first thought, okay, I'm going to look at a film of uh, Mr. Uh, Tchaikovsky, and of course it is. But then later I realized that it's a beautiful story of modern Russia, post-Soviet Russia. And that made me wonder, forgive me, I'm a journalist, so I write stories as well. It made me wonder, was it your idea to make a story about Russia? And did you find a protagonist, or did you find him, followed him, and discovered, I made a story about modern Russia? All of the above. I mean, I, I think that in, uh, you know, after the U.S. election in 2016, I realized that uh, we hadn't been p paying enough attention to Russia. And, and so I, I was interested in doing a story about Russia. Um, and then my producers, P.J. Ben Sandwick and John Batsk, introduced me to Hadakovsky. And I knew about him, but I didn't know that much about him. And, and I met with him, and it seemed like that would be an interesting way of telling a story. Because if you're looking at the subject of power, here is a guy who went from nothing to being at the very top and then at the very bottom, and then you know in exile trying to make a difference somewhere else. So that seemed a good um, way of, of following a story. But the challenge in the cutting room was to put in just enough material and background about the history of Russia itself and from, you know, basically Gorbachev on to be able to set it in, in a proper context. And also, you know, to have a parallel rise story with Putin. Because that was um, one of the other things, and I know that some people from the ITVA organization, we were discussing the film, and we were all wondering, should I sympathize with this man? Is he something I should feel sorry for, um, or the other way around? And um, did you have this question as well during this first meeting, or did this question grow on you? Did, did you even struggle with this question? I did struggle with that question, and it, it was the same question I asked. I mean, here's a guy who, well, he just got another 100 million out of um, mm -hmm. Ireland, and he's, he had another four stashed away. I mean, and he had been worth 12 billion. Is this a guy we should sympathize with? At the same time, you know, um, he had been a powerful voice in terms of um, advocating for change inside Russia while he was in a prison cell. And I'd read his writings, and they were very perceptive and powerful. So what do you reckon? How do you reckon with that? And I thought that that's what makes him an interesting character, is that you don't know. And, and I think for, for half the film, I mean, it's interesting, you know, I've, I've gotten some feedback from Russia, and mm -hmm. um, those in the Kremlin who have seen it, you know, love the first half and hate the second half. <laughs> yeah. Hodakovsky feels just the opposite. Yeah. Can I make, how was that for you, Derek? Yeah, well, you know, what I particularly liked about this film, I've seen many films about Putin, made by Western journalists. And most of all of them are very black and white. I mean, Putin is just a bad guy, and the opposition are the good guys. Um, I think this is one of the first movies I saw that puts it in a better perspective. Good and bad in those days was extremely hard to distinguish from each other. And, you know, uh, Khodorkovsky was a very powerful and smart man Putin is also a very powerful and smart man. Only their paths of life, you know, went completely the other direction. Um, and that makes it so interesting because, you know, uh, Khodorkovsky comes from the same age, same generation as Putin. They have the same background. They, you know, both come from the Komsomol. Uh, uh, so they have actually the way, the same way of looking at life. Only Khodorkovsky ended up you know, on the wrong side of the track, so to speak, you know. Um, and by 
by his jail, he became a martyr. You know, the way he behaved in jail, in the, in the gulag, because it was a gulag, really changed him and, and also the perception of him to the Russian public. Yeah, we've seen that the first the people uh, protest against him and then they cheer for him. That's the, and before, because that's also something I'd like to discuss, but before uh, doing that, you already told us about your first meeting with him. We briefly saw your first meeting with him, or we didn't see it, you, 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 you told us about it, and you said it was hard to distinguish between good and bad. Why, there were seven oligarchs to choose from, why did you pick him, why did you want to cooperate yeah, with him? Because he was, what, what is called in Russia, skromny. He was the most modest of all these guys. <laughs> you, I mean, the other guys, from day one, they had the golden watches, the big cars, the villas, the yachts. And he was not interested in that. He's never been interested in that. And that really set him so much aside from the other, other oligarchs. And as he said, he was interested in the process. He really loved building a first class you know, company. That is what he was doing. He wasn't partying. You know, he didn't have, he's been with his wife all his life. All these oligarchs had you know, girlfriends and hookers and you know, what have you. Uh, he was a, he, you know, he was actually a nice guy, but I must add to that, that around him, he had <laughs> yeah. some very, very tough people. And, you know, uh, uh, you know, and I cannot vouch for what happened. I've been threatened by some of his close friends. Uh, Lebedev, who was in the film, uh, threatened me several occasions when we at the Moscow Times wrote about mm -hmm. You know, all the things they were doing, you know, how they were screwing minority shareholders in their company. So, but he always behaved very nice. So, 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 <laughs> yeah, yeah, we just heard. But how did, did, did you, were you able to call him and say, hey, one of your employees is threatening me? How does, how does that go? Yeah, I did. Okay. Uh, of <laughs> course I did, you know, I didn't like it. And, you know, that's one of the things that comes also out of this film, this is what Khodorkovsky said, the only way you can survive in Russia is to be tough, because they just try you out. If you give in, uh, then you're done. So I, I behaved the same way with Khodorkovsky, and it worked. And how, um, because I think that's also a question that many of us will have, is how can a man who's so uh, incredibly intelligent, who immediately saw the potential during the 90s, um, and of course, oh, there are lots of answers in the film, but still, why did he make the decision to take that extra risk, was it? Um, because I think the idealism came later in prison, right? Was, what was the... Well, I mean, he had a different... Um, I mean, it's still the mystery that hangs over the film. Why did he take that extra risk? And he says, look, I wasn't going to trade... Um, you know, I, m my life didn't mean that much for exchanging it for self-respect. Yeah. He was a tough guy, and so I think there was a certain macho element there. I think there was a certain calculation, like I'm pretty powerful. There's, you know, he, 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 the worst thing he thought was gonna happen to him was that he might spend a year in jail, right? But also, I think at that time, in the early 2000s, he began to have different kinds of political aspirations and was chafing under the idea that he was supposed to just stick to business. So, you know, he had a, a political mission. So for all those reasons, he decided he wasn't going to back down, even in the face of all his lieutenants being arrested. Um, and, I mean, the writing was clearly on the wall. Yeah. Does, he, does he show any regret uh, for his behavior in the past, during the 90s? Is he, because I, 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 I've looked at this twice and I didn't really find it. I found it hard to see self-criticism. I, I think the idea is some. I think his view about the 90s is that he says it himself, look, I saw it as a game. Mm -hmm. um, and, <laughs> and he was good at playing the game, but it was also a game with no rules. Mm -hmm. And so in a game with no rules, some pretty terrible things can happen. Um, and, and I think he, he felt he was just you know, doing the best he could under those circumstances. And, and it was the circumstances. That's how he would define it. You know, it's hard, to, it's hard to know, but he also says um, that 
he learned that it wasn't just the game when the ruble fell and oil prices fell and suddenly he had to come face to face with his employees. Other people say that may be, you know, um, reinvention. But I do, that was one area where I, 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 I began to sense that, that um, whether it's revisionism or, or not, he concluded that the game actually had pretty high stakes and that for many people who weren't in the position that he was in, it was a matter of life and death, this game. Um, and so I think that did have an impact on him, and it was something that reverberated in his brain while he was in prison without any power. Yeah, I, I, I strongly believe that by the time of his arrest, he's, he was still convinced that he was untouchable. You know, don't forget the guy had a private army of thousands of soldiers. I mean, he really had an army. Um, so, you know, he, he could not imagine that me, you know, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, the most important oligarch, you know, will be put away, you know, so, um, which was foolish, you know, he, he just didn't understand that the times were changing very fast. Um, and I believe the real, the real change came with being 10 years in a gulag. Because then you, you know, I mean, first of all, you have plenty of time to think about, you know, life. Um, and, you know, he was writing very deeply, deep thoughts in jail. And I was publisher of Venomisty, the newspaper, the, the editor, the woman that's in the film was my editor. And he sent a lot of those letters to our newspaper. We've been publishing a lot of his writings. And in those, you know, you could see the development in, in he was, you know, he, as he was in jail, he was thinking about his future role. Yeah, so he says things. I mean, you know, it's hard to, um, when you have somebody who's writing from prison, that he came to the realization that life is not about having, it's about being. That's a pretty profound thought for, for an oligarch, you know, who, who you know, and, and as Derek says, you know, most of the other oligarchs were into Ferraris and hookers. You know, you, you wouldn't see most of them coming up with that kind of statement, or I'm not an ideal man, but I'm a man of ideals. You know, this is, this is somebody who great, gave a great deal of thought to what his position in society was and how society should be structured, and even more profoundly, what it means to be a human being. I, I think he learned that in prison. I mean, Tatiana Lisova says, you know, I, it, it's a hard thing to say, but I think he became a better man in prison. Well, what's his biggest mistake? What's the, well, could he have prevented this in some way? You mean, could he have prevented going to prison? Yes, exactly, yes. Not on the trajectory he was on, mm -hmm. but um, I mean, he, he could have seen it coming. He should have seen it coming. Lebedev goes to prison, um, you know, Nevzlin flees the country. Um, it, it should have been obvious to him. And, and, and let's not forget that today there are tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of business people in Russia in jail uh, on cooked up charges. You know, this is, you know, this is what is continuing. You know, Mike Calfi, you know, Russia's most famous investor, uh, he's under house arrest. He's a foreigner, so he's lucky he's under house arrest. But three of his directors have been in jail now for, for more than a year. It's going on and on and on. Yeah, that's also something because uh, we saw the Olympic Games. And there was a moment that he was being freed um, uh, also to make a gest uh, gesture towards the West. And then I had, the same, I had the same thought. There are so many people in prison. And of course, they're released more. But why was the West uh, sort of lobbying for him? Because we see some uh, diplomatic lobbying on his behalf. Did, did you find any of that? Or did you Look, I, I think he had, he had become famous. He had become famous both because he, you know, before he was put in prison, he was a guy who was negotiating, um, you know, a, a merger with, with Exxon. You know, so his, he was, uh, people were aware, well aware of him in, in the corridors of power in the West. Um, but I think, you know, through his time in prison, his um, uh, his stature increased to a great extent. So it be it became an easy way of focusing on one person as a way of saying, "Oh yeah, you say you're so free and open, but what about Hadakovsky?" Though I mean, <laughs> I think it's not a coincidence that 
that that Putin decided to release Pussy Riot and Hodakovsky on the same day. Yeah. Uh, what actually is so interesting, so Putin decides to release those two people, um, and then there is there are these crazy people in the West who start about the gay issue. You know, remember that? Yes, the, yes. The, uh, the, the anti-gay law? Yeah, with the mayor here standing up so, for them. So, yeah. and, and most Western uh, leaders decide not to go to the Olympics. He just released Khodorkovsky and Pussy Riot, so, you know, Putin thinks, well, now everyone will come and, and everything will be okay. And that's the moment he said, fuck them. <laughs> and the next week, they annexed the Crimea. Yeah. Literally two weeks after the, the Olympics. Oh, that's incredible. So they make mistakes too, or at least diplomatic mistakes. Uh, Absolutely. Well, I, I don't know how you can qualify, but the, 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 the sequence of events is extremely interesting. Yeah. And because you end, one of the conclusions towards the end is that um, this country, let's say both political sides have a problem with uh, nostalgia. And, that, um, and to sell liberalism now with his face on, is it, is it possible? Because, um, and I think you both know Russian society better, but he, his image has changed, we have followed that, but won't he be sort of a business card for the kind of liberalism we have seen in the 90s? Is it, is it useful what he's doing? Look, I think that, um, I mean, um, Derek says it and Igor Malashenko says it, I think his ability to become an in-person political figure in Russia is, is, it's not happening, it's not possible, both because of his past and also because he's not permitted to, to go there uh, or to even appear on television. So I think at least uh, for the moment, he has satisfied himself with a kind of um, role of support, you know, either by doing investigations or helping investigations or by supporting other figures like Navalny and others. But the idea of returning there, I think he, he's dying to go back, but there's no way it's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah I mean, Russians are very bad in exile. You know, Russians always long back to the home country. So he's, he's just, he's the typical Russian exile who only thinks day and night about Russia, you know, and, and returning. Um, but having said that, you know, his foundation is doing a lot of good stuff uh, that is not very sexy, not very visible, but they support small, local journalists, small initiatives, uh, civil society groups. We at the Moscow Times work very closely with, with some of their reporters. And um, so, you know, I, I applaud what he's doing now. But the thought that he can ever be an influential figure again, you know, okay. as Alex said, that's, that's not going to happen. That's good. And, and you clearly say, I applaud him for what he's doing and he d is doing wonderful things when uh, you, of course, portray the side of him uh, and also at the analysis or the conclusion to that that sometimes it doesn't have that much effect. They don't even have enough glue to glue the things on the wall and they, um, or, or is that a mistake on my side? Well, but, but I, I, it's both quixotic and, and also real and important at the same time. Because, you know, it's like the whole approach, you know, let's leave Hodakovsky for a second. Let's think of, of um, uh, Alexei Navalny. You know, so he's not gonna boycott, so he's calling for a voting strike. Now, what's the difference between a boycott and strike? But they're trying to find some way of protesting the phony democracy, election theater, while at the same time not giving up on it, because if you give up on it, then, you know, um, authoritarian uh, powers win, right? So how do you do that? And it becomes a kind of very tricky and difficult uh, road to navigate. And so I think that, you know, uh, you have to try. And, and I, I'm with Derek. I give Hodakovsky great credit for trying and trying to engage in some way even though the idea is absurd. He, he makes a big deal out of going to Hanover to vote hmm. and then he ruins yeah. his ballot, right? Yes. Um, yeah. and, and doesn't even support the opposition candidate that he is supporting financially or... Uh, 
That, that surprised me. So he's funding her, right? Or he's helping <laughs> yeah, but, her? I mean, he and also knows. He also knows very well that this was a, a fake, total game. Yes. Uh, theater, you know, I, nonsense. It's one of I the. I think that Subchak. Yeah. I, I, I don't. I can't prove it, but I'm fairly certain that Subchak's campaign was actually supported by the Kremlin. Mm. She is the loyal opposition. Yes. You know, but at the same time, Hadakovsky... Uh, Senya now has a show on the first channel. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, yes. And the first channel is the, the official it's state propaganda channel. So, here and, you have it. And you already said that there are, there, there are some mysteries surrounding him. And why is he then still sort of supporting the theater? That's... that's well, so supporting the, election theater, but but I think the, the, you're not... You don't support... I, I'll let Dirk pick it up. I mean, you know... But it's not supporting the theater. It's just continuing to try to keep alive debate about civil society. Yeah. I think that's what it's about. And so even in the theater, like when you go to the theater, you realize it's a fiction, but yeah. actually there's some meaningful things can happen in theater, right? Yeah. And, um, <laughs> you know, so, yeah. so, so I think that's the reason. It seems absurd, but at the same time, I think it's terribly important. Mm. It's adding a liberal actor to the, to the stage. Yeah. Yes, okay. Yeah, <clears throat> I think he, he sort of wants to support all the voices that are not, you know, 100% Kremlin voices. But <clears throat> I think much more important than that, and that is what's not so much in the film because it's all a little bit hidden and mm -hmm. they don't publicize that a lot because, you know, it, it endangers the lives of those people uh, that he's supporting in the regions, especially local journalists. Mm -hmm. Uh, local bloggers and so on. It's you know you have no idea how dangerous it is to be an independent journalist in a small town somewhere in Russia yeah. these days. So and you know uh, if he can support it, you know, bless him. And and by the way, th this dossier program that is mentioned in the film. Yes. I mean, information gained from dossier, and they have really good sources. Um, feeds a lot of journalism worldwide about Russia. So it, 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 it acts as an important avenue for understanding what's actually going on inside the country. And when I was, again, watching this film for the first time, I was wondering what is his, uh, what is his stake? Why did he decide to cooperate? And then, of course, probably because he knew I'm doing all those amazing things. I like to tell what I'm doing. Does he, has he protested uh, to you that you were also dedicating the first half an hour to his history and how he came so he became so rich. You know, he's an interesting character that way. I sat next to him at the premiere of the film at the Venice Film Festival, and when you sit sit next to somebody and a film is critical about that subject, it's extremely uncomfortable. I I felt uncomfortable, but you know, at the end of the day, for him, it's like, well, that's your job. You're going to do what you're going to do, and uh, there's nothing I can do to control it. And maybe there's some things. I don't like, but so what? It's your film, which I found hugely refreshing. I, there is a, um, you know, there's another, there are a couple of other characters who are interested in having their stories told, but they're far more controlling, and as a result, their stories haven't been told so far. Hodakovsky was like, ask whatever questions you were going to ask. He didn't decline to answer any of them. In that way, I, I found him a very compelling character. It's like, okay, I've agreed to participate, I'll give you a lot of time, and then you do what you do. Well, that's impressive. Yeah, it's, that, that's not a mystery. Um, this man is constantly smiling, he's constantly calm, he's constantly, sometimes there is a bit of this modest, macho character. Is he never a, truly emotional, that he flips, that he becomes fearful, that he, I don't know, it becomes sad. I, I've been in many, many meetings with the guy <laughs> because in the very early beginnings, um, you have to understand Russia was, you know, they, they, he also knew nothing about capitalism or, and I was involved in choosing the logo of Yukos. You know, who am I? I'm just a journalist. But he was building this big, big company and he needed market. He had no idea about marketing. Well, you know, nothing existed. Advertising agency, they didn't exist. So he asked me to bring in a, an English advertising agency and we came up with this Yukos logo. I mean, this is how it went. And so I've been in many meetings and he was always very quiet, always controlled. I've never seen him sort of you know, get angry or emotional. Maybe, you know, 
there were times, but you know, I've had many interactions with him, never seen it. I, I, I feel exactly the same way. There was, a, there was a small moment, not off camera, not on camera, when I, when I saw him getting ready for this, um, uh, this, this sort of get together that we photographed where he was presenting you know, some of his activities and, and somebody had done something wrong and you could see the flash of the oligarch you know, <laughs> upset that, that, that his instructions hadn't been followed to the letter. But that said, he's very difficult. I mean, he has a sense of reserve. You know, there's an interesting moment in the film and it's when Subchuk is interviewing him right after he gets out of um, the gulag. And she says, aren't you angry at some of the people who put you in prison? And he says, this is amazing, he says, it would be a sin against the truth yes, to say quote. that I don't have some feelings about the matter. Now, that's not Oprah. <laughs> that's not laying it on the line. But at the same time, if you watch carefully, you can see his eyes roll back in his head as if he's trying to keep the steam from coming out of his ears. So this is a guy who's got anger. He's got deep anger, mm. but he is in control a lot of the time, and you don't see him blow. Uh, yes. but, but, but what... I, I think it's important to say or to now that the director is here. What what I really like in the film that it comes across also that Putin also had few chances, few options uh, differently than what he did. You know because you know you cannot have an oligarch run the ministry of the economy. You know it, it's just if Putin. Uh, uh, wanted to establish himself as the real president, he had to be in charge. And if he wanted to be in charge, he had to beat Khodorkovsky. Now, he did it, of course, in, in a very unsympathetic way. Um, and the trials were a joke, especially the second trial. It was very well shown. Um, but I mean, what else could Putin do? I think I absolutely agree, and because I I think I have to finish off. It's really what makes the film wonderful is that you see Putin. It, indeed, one of the, it's one of the few times I've seen Putin in a way that I thought, yeah, okay. The other guy got what he deserved and, and you were doing something for your country. But that's, um, so yeah, that's uh, wonderful. I think I also um, um, appreciated Putin more as a politician. You know, politicians are designed to make people feel good and to feel something. And, you know, that's not something I fully appreciated until I did the film. You know, going, it's, it's a little bit different in Moscow, but if you go to some place like Nevtyugansk or Krasnokomensk, you know, uh, the view about Putin is a little bit different. And also you see his skill, whether, and, you know, polit good politicians do things like sing Fats Domino. You know, it's, uh, <laughs> you know, you, you, yeah, and ice hockey, yeah. So. Um, he, he, it's intriguing. I mean, he's not the guy who's walled away in the castle. He's he's uh, he's got the grease paint. You you would be able to know. The, though I'm I'm amused to to learn. And this was something I was told by um, some of the folks at uh, at Open Russia that they've done face. Somebody did with face recognition software. They discovered that when Putin goes to these sort of vox pop moments, he goes like getting an ice cream from the ice cream vendor or pizza from the pizza guy or slapping the postal guy on the, on the back, that if you do facial recognition software, you discover that those people in those scenes, there's about, actually about eight or ten yeah, of the yeah, same they people. Actors. They're actors. They're yes. actors. <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, that's, that's absolutely right. Uh, uh, but, but, but still, I mean, a lot of Putin films I've seen, they don't recognize the, the reality that Putin just was, was and still to a large extent is, although it's less now, but still is, an incredibly popular leader. You know? and, and I think in the West, many people close, just close their eyes. They only see the bad part of Putin. Um, and this film is, 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 makes it very, clear why he came on this path. Now, of course, like every leader who stays too long, it goes off the rails, you know, and it's, it, it has nothing to do with Putin as a person. It has to do with if you're 18 years in such a powerful position, uncontrolled, 
no media controlling you, no independent law, uh, legal system. You know, then, you know, even the best of human beings turn into very nasty people. Yes. And to show how complex the process is, I think it's wonderful. I think we should applaud you one more time for a wonderful film. Thank you Thank so much. You.